tonight on The Big Interview. Anne and Nancy Wilson of Heart. There's almost a missionary zeal about yeah. doing music in the beginning that really got us going. They were the first women to front a hard rock band, a distinction they pushed to the side. I don't think we were that interested in being gender-centric. Right. It, it was about the music, whoever Who, could play it best. Who plays better. Although that's not always the way you were judged. That's right. True. You know something just right. What about love? There were some people that came along and said, this is what you should look like and this is what you should be like. Did you sell out? Yeah. Rockers, songwriters, sisters. Anne and Nancy Wilson, tonight on The Big Interview. Hard rock was a man's world in the 1970s. That is, until sisters Anne and Nancy Wilson came on the scene as the leaders of the band Heart. Younger sister Nancy rocked it on guitar, while older sister Anne wowed the crowds with her powerhouse voice, considered to be one of the all-time best in rock and roll. The Wilsons played the instruments and wrote the songs. Hits you still hear on classic rock radio around the country today. Barracuda. Barracuda. Try, try, try to He's a magic man, mama. Magic man. Crazy on you. And crazy on you. Hart has sold over 35 million albums. They've had 20 top 40 hits. And in 2013, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Since they first started out in Vancouver in the mid-1970s, the sound, look, and members of the band have changed a lot over the years. What about love? Don't you want someone to care about you? What about love? When they reluctantly abandoned their hard rock roots for the big hair and power ballads of the 1980s, songs like What About Love and These Dreams became some of their biggest hits. But 40 years on, the heart of heart remains the same. Anne and Nancy Wilson, two sisters who are decidedly passionate about rock and roll. Dan Rather, thank you so nice much for doing you. this. Welcome to Chaos. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I met up with them in Los Angeles at the end of their summer tour. Well, I know the summer's big tour time because of the weather. Did you go well? Yes, very well. Um, people are coming out to see us. And buying tickets well, and you everything. Well, shouldn't, so. you shouldn't say that with any surprise. People have <laughs> been doing that for a very long time. <laughs> yes, well, yeah. that, that's the surprise in itself, as you know, 40 right. years later. Well, what it tells me, though, you don't take it for granted. Yeah. I guess for, for, uh, for me and for us, you know, the real trick is, is remaining authentic and not just going out and going, well, let's become caricatures. Yeah. Here, 40 years on, we're just caricatures. Or jute know. boxes. Yeah, either. I'd like to follow up on that. You said one of the things that is a constant challenge for you is to remain authentic. So let's start from uh, ground zero. First of all, as, as a performing group, who are you? Well, I think we're um, a really unlikely set of, uh, you know, circumstances that makes this band heart what it is. I think we're kind of a rare animal in rock and roll because there's two women for one thing two sisters at the center and so there's an emotional um breadth which is not just surface pop kind of cultural stuff there's a lot of depth in the songs that we choose to do and write 
and you know d we want to do so there's something really weird about us <laughs> you know just don't really fit the bill well, I don't know what Maybe I'd call it a good weird. Thing. what do you, what do you think thing. well we we bring a lot of the anima of heart out of our family it just comes straight from our parents and our grandparents and their generation who sat around with ukuleles after World War II. <laughs> that's where we first heard music, you know, being sung. So that's really right at the core of why we care so much about our band being authentic, to go out there and be posers or uh, be become a cartoon would almost be to laugh in the face of our parents. <laughs> well, tell me about those days when the parents and grandparents were playing the ukuleles. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, our father was a Marine officer, and um, so we, we grew up on all the different military bases, Quantico, Camp Lejeune, Camp Pendleton, Panama, Taiwan, you know, everywhere where the forces were in the 50s and 60s. And um, we were on military bases with other Marine families and their children. And so the adults would all get together, and what they liked to do would be to have cocktail parties and sing. <laughs> Their generation wouldn't just turn on the radio. They would actually sing together. And they'd sing old English pub songs and kind of off-color songs, you know. It was fun stuff for all the kids who'd been put to bed, right? Yeah. But who really were upstairs at the top of the stairs listening. Yeah, he's dropping. Ears. Um, there was a song that they sang when they had had a lot of cocktails that we heard over and over. It was like, my eyes are dim, I cannot see. I have not brought my specs. And then a long time goes by, they're walking around talking for a really long time. And everyone's waiting for the, the shoe to drop. And finally, it's like, with me. Yeah. And they would do this like religiously at these parties. And it yeah. was just hysterical, the kind of unity that I think coming out of the World War, you know, situation yeah. and unity that they had, you know, regardless of the horror that they were experiencing, they had their humor and they had their caps on yeah. and their music. Well, I'm interested <laughs> in, in how you think it affected you for good and bad, plus and minus. My own experience, which is limited with military families such as your own, which is to say where you have a career military person in the family is that children in military families either they become the proverbial wild child or move back into a shell and have difficulty relating socially. Now it sounds like that you didn't have either one of those problems. So my question <laughs> is how did you avoid that? Yeah, good question. Um, I think without music, without each other, in this very aimed project or you know lifestyle of doing heart we probably would have gone to one of those stereotypes you would have been the interior yeah and i would have been the wild child yeah <laughs> but but instead we found that music was not only satisfying to us but it had outreach at first when we first started doing it you could do a song like, say, For What It's Worth. And it had meaning in the culture, and you could sing it. And um, you sort of helped people's minds clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was, almost a, there was almost a missionary zeal about yeah. doing music in the beginning that really got us going. That's right. Being sisters, I mean, old siblings fight. <laughs> yes. 
What did you, what do you tend to fight about? <laughs> We're well, so dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> we probably should learn how to fight yeah. <laughs> better than we do because we sort of, we kind of, uh, we get more icy about yeah. our differences and what we want to do and or don't want to do and how to steer the ship, which is our band called Heart that we have been leaders of for a long time now, since the late 70s. And we've gone through every era that you could possibly go through where, yeah. you know, I was sort of missing in action for a while and then you were missing in action. So I, so we kind of covered for each other depending on who's more kind of destructed at the time. By missing in action, you mean having some kind of personal life trauma at the time? Yeah, yeah, like, you know, going through addiction stuff or going through personal dramas, you know, um, divorces, trying to have kids and all those various things that, you know, to be a real human on, in, on the planet, you try to do more than just be in a rock band. You try to get all the other <laughs> stuff done, too. So we've actually been able to have an, I think, what's a really amazing relationship, um, supportive relationship of each other, and a space-giving relationship mm -hmm. for each other. Yeah, when I say it's dis dysfunctional, I say that sometimes we, uh, we will sidestep confrontation. <laughs> right. You know, because we're out on the road, you know, it's five minutes before we're supposed to walk on. Is this the moment to have a big confrontation? <laughs> I don't think so. You know, and so then we go do the show and we feel great and the confrontation is forgotten. Well, that's not a bad way of dealing with it. No. Well, right. how did heart come to be? I mean, you talked about family music. Fortunately, <laughs> a saving grace, the family is able to laugh at itself, at a sense of humor. Yeah. But at some point, you decide to make this band and call it heart. Yeah. How did that happen? Well, it's all your fault. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've started out having family bands. The Prunes, the Viewpoints. Rapunzel. The, it's just little family bands. <laughs> they were more folk in nature. And then when I got to high school, Nancy wasn't in high school yet, so there was a natural sort of division where I met boys in high school who had bands, and I got into a couple bands in high school. And um, then after that, I met, I actually answered an ad that the guys who were in Heart, existing Heart, the original. put in the uh, newspaper for a singer and a drummer, and uh, got the job. And uh, <laughs> so I joined up with them, and of course I said, Nancy, you gotta come along, you gotta join this band. And she was in college at the time, wanted to have a university education first. So, um, it took us uh, several years to couple coerce. A couple of years yeah. of university first, but you know, then the money was running out, so I joined the band. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really the making of Heart as we know it. Yeah. I think I joined Heart in 75 or 74. Yeah, right when we got the record deal. <laughs> yeah, right when things got easier for you guys. <laughs> By the way, I want to loop back to something you said. You said being slightly older, uh, that you got to high school before Nancy got to high school, mm -hmm. and that the boys had bands, and you wanted to get in the band, and you got in the band. I mean, did you get into boys, or were you, was it more the music, or what was it? Was it are you asking, it in, yeah, or, was it the boys or, or the it, music? That's where the boys are, so I'm going where the boys are. Where the boys are. Um, well, actually, <laughs> it, for me, it was where the music is, mm -hmm. and, and the boys came along with it, but I, my major drive to get into bands was to be in a band, to get to get up there and sing and deliver those lyrics. I was a word person. Now at that time, Nancy, were you saying, well, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what she says, but she's in, but she, wants, she wants to be with these boys. Well, of course, everybody wants to be around cute young guys if you're a cute young girl, but there was more of a, of a, of a method about getting onto stages and learning how to do the, the craft and singing those words, being as much like the Beatles as possible. I mean, right. when you think of it, there weren't a lot of options either. You know, all the bands were guys. Yeah. Well, did you ever discuss it yourself saying, listen, 
you know, there aren't any girl bands. Maybe we should. <laughs> well, we tried to put a couple of girl bands together, and it, for some reason, the democracy wasn't really working for us because we were, we were so, such leaders about it, and they were just kind of like the sheep that we told them everything that what to do, and there just wasn't confidence about them as women, as girls. I don't think we were that interested in being gender-centric. Right. It, it was about the music. Yeah. And who, whoever who, could play it best. Who plays better. Yeah. Although that's not always the way you were judged. That's right. True. Yeah. That's I, I know right. you must be sick of the question of, you know, what's it like to be a, a, a woman's band in a man's world. But it's part of who you became and part of the way you became. So let's talk about it as much as you can. Yeah. Um, well, there were some things, if I could speak for you for a second, sure. when she was, before me, she was already in the guys' bands, and there were some people that came along and said, well, you know, you should be wearing makeup, and you should be, you know, you should wear the clothes where you can, you know, shorter skirts, or see the light between your thighs, or this is what you should look like, and this is what you should be like. Particularly if you can be a rocker. Yeah, yeah, and that was pretty off-putting and pretty insulting, and she, she, she was really pissed off about that and let me know about like, can you believe you know what these people are trying to make me do, who they're trying to make me be? Yeah, we were raised by a mother never laid down the rules of what girls are supposed to be. She just said, "Be yourself," and she never mentioned that you had to have. X amount of light between your thighs, or <laughs> this was not the language spoken in our family, so it was all news to me that there was this dictate from the world of rock men that uh, this is what the image of a rock woman had to be. Um, ultimately, can I say fuckable or um, ornamental, not necessarily in charge or out there really being mindful, you know. So that, that came as a real shock to me. And we did, both of us uh, had to do a, a lot of hard scrabble pushing to just say, this is not us, you know. Yeah. To gain credibility, especially in the 70s, once we had a record out and um, it was still all male dominated record scene back then. Just. People saying things to her, backhanded things like, uh, wow, you're a great guitarist for a girl. Is that really plugged in? Is that, <laughs> is is that guitar just a, really plugged in? Or is it just a prop, you know? You know, like, no, I've been you playing are since so I was beautiful, you know. this tall. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that kind of stuff now seems small, but at the, at the time when you're just starting out and there's no precedent for um, respect of women in rock, it was hurtful. Anybody who's been in the music business as long as you have been, maybe anybody's too strong, but eventually alcohol, some version of drugs, affects everybody who's been in the business. Oh, yeah. You know, each of you had your struggles. Let's talk about how did you get through it. I'm interested, and I think people are always interested, how you survive. Mm -hmm. We've always had a professional work ethic that a lot of people we saw falling away on the, by the wayside, not having. 
we never allowed any kind of party, you know, thing to sort of replace the thrill of just being on a live stage and being there on time and doing a good job. There's only been a couple of times ever that we yeah. we kind of blew it that way and we we just regretted it Learned from forever, it. you know. Yeah. I think even nowadays it might even be a tougher gig to be in rock and roll because there's more insidious substances out there that you can go for. But coming from a mind expanded era like the late sixties where the Beatles, you know, Sgt. Pepper and all of that music was our church and and those were our spiritual directions that we wanted to be and journeys that we wanted to be on. So like when the eighties came along with all of the sort of cocaine of it all, you know, it was no it was no longer a church. And so I think we were always trying to steer back to the meaningful church of our purpose to be here in music. While you were going through that, I'm not asking for Why a would confession, you want to? but what was your biggest demon? We all have demons. Demon. We all have things to fight and hope to overcome. What was your biggest or worst one? Well, my biggest demon personally was, was um, beautiful red wine. <laughs> <laughs> really excellent, high quality red wine. Um, I didn't used to get messy or sloppy on it, but I was a maintenance every day drinker, you know, for a long time. It just kind of gradually got more and more, and I, I didn't really think anything of it, you know. But then I sort of, uh, it became obvious that, that it was taking its toll, and, and, um, and uh, my doctor said, no, th this you're is done. it. <laughs> yeah, you're done. Yeah, you're done now. <laughs> and I took her seriously. And uh, so that that was really mine. And plus, uh, on top of that, you know, I have two kids. So you're being a mom who travels with two kids and beautiful, gorgeous red wine, you know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and fantastic cheese, you know. I mean, you can, you like you can make it sound as wine? elegant as you want, but the, <laughs> but the distance from your kids is the same. No. To use the euphemism, have you gone back to the grape or are you finished with it? No, I'm finished with the grape. <laughs> I've been off the grape now for since uh, November 13th of 09. Oh, that's a good long run. Yeah, but it's, it's uh, you know, every day is another decision. Yeah. That's and right. And with you? With me, I, I was kind of a dabbler all over the place, you know. I tried everything and I think for me cocaine was the worst thing for a while that happened that I couldn't seem to get rid of in my life and this sounds really really weird to say but I had a problem uh, with cocaine and then I realized that I wanted to try something else so I tried ecstasy yeah <laughs> which made it way more fun than cocaine. So down, I thought right? it was it was a stepping down from a really insidious drug to a less insidious drug, which was hard to find, and then I just sort of stopped doing now, drugs. Were you with her along on this ride? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was along on the ecstasy ride, too. But with your quality Cabernet Sauvignon oh, at St. Paul. Always. With red wine. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, and, I laugh uh, about it, but it, it, it's tough to overcome that. Yeah, and this has ruined a lot of people, not to say yes. only a lot of bands, ruined a lot of people. people. Yes. Yeah. And it takes, you can never say that it's completely, that you're completely healed, because it isn't like a, a blister. It's, you have to always, there's a reason. There's a, there's something inside that you voice. that needs to be filled, yeah. you know, and. Love is a great antidote to addiction. I was just about to say that, <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes when fame sets in, loneliness is a companion. Mm -hmm. Did that happen with each of you individually, or was it okay as you got fame because you're sisters and together? Having my sister right next to me throughout this has helped immeasurably. 
with that loneliness because that's a deep, a deep loneliness that you speak of. It's going up on stage and receiving hyper love. Good night, everyone. From the audience and then going away into a hotel room or onto a bus or whatever. What takes the place of that extreme fireball of <laughs> absolute love that they throw you? Right. And the people that don't do well, I think, are the people that really believe it, that go, yeah, I am. I'm larger than I life. am God here, you know. Yeah. I mean, they, <laughs> Let's talk about writing your own songs. You know, you're, you're rightly famous for writing your own songs. But at some point, you were told to open yourselves up to outside songwriters. How did you feel about that? We didn't take it at all well. <laughs> we, <laughs> we took it as a personal affront. <laughs> it's, that's, a, that's a Wilson specialty, <laughs> taking things personally and, and um, just going, well, Mr. Businessman, <laughs> then we'll write songs for you as you require them, you know, and, and get all sarcastic and <laughs> try and write songs the way they're being played on the radio and fail at that and end up using songs from other writers, other writers that are huge smashes for us. That, that was a hard time. It was a big blow to our artistic ego. But it, it turned out they were right in a way. Yeah, they, they were right. Um, <laughs> the times they were changing again and the type of perspective we had in our songs was, it was old news, mm -hmm. you know. We've been on the road so long too that we didn't have much real life experience to write about yeah. for a while there either. Um, you know, a, a home life, for example, or other experiences besides road life. But interestingly, when the 90s came along and we were sort of packing it up for like the end of the 80s, we were like, okay, well, I guess we've already lived a couple of lifespans and that might be it for us. We went back to Seattle and that's where Seattle exploded. And suddenly the whole switch was turned on music and what was popular in music. And suddenly it was the Seattle sound. And it was guitars again. It was Nirvana, Soundgarden, and Pearl Jam, and Alice. Alice in Chains. And they were all like, they're friends of ours now. And they were looking up to us for what we'd achieved in the previous couple decades at the time. And we were like, really? You don't hate us for having big hair? You know, because the 80s, you know, the big hair. But um, they were sweet and they were sincere and they have made us feel like we didn't suck, you know. <laughs> but is it fair or unfair to say that in terms of your creativity, you felt the least fulfilled at this time? Yeah, I think in the latter part of the 80s and early 90s was for me personally the least satisfying time of all. I felt this close to not even wanting to do it because back to authenticity that is so important to me you know it's necessary to go up there and mean what I say be what I say I am yeah. and want to be there with something worthwhile to bring and you're in the 80s and you're singing a song that somebody else has written and given to you not even your own words not something you would never even have thought of <laughs> and suddenly I have turned into a chanteuse nothing more <laughs> Uh, and that's okay, no flies on a chanteuse, but it's, it's a <laughs> few steps down from, from Paul Simon. Well, when she got into this mood, she obviously was in this mood for quite a while, did you say to her, hey, come off of it? You may feel that way, but <laughs> we're, out of it. we're making a lot of, frankly, we're making a lot of good money here, and we're keeping ourselves relevant, or were you the one to say that, or somebody else had to say it to her? Well, I was trying to survive in my own way because they were putting me kind of out front, like get the blonde girl up front. And, and I, I was having a hard time finding my own identity in that same era. making the world's biggest money we'd ever made, but it just felt 
pretty hollow, you know. And I mean, even to a point where there was a, a <laughs> there was a uh, show we were offered a great big huge festival or something, and they were like, "It's the most money we've ever ever been offered. Only trouble is, it's on your wedding day." <laughs> so I'm like. I'm not going to change my right. wedding, yeah. you know, like it was just that kind of a decade and coming out of it was more comfortable than being in it, even though the money was really amazing. What about love? Don't you want someone to care about? Looking back on it with time now perspective, did you sell out? Yeah, that's a good so. question. Yeah, I think being put into a harness on a video stage and yeah. jumping off of a building with cameras rolling with a, gu with a guitar on and big hair and, <laughs> and a corset and, and a corset fake high fingernail. heels. Yeah, it, that was kind of a selling out. Time. Well, not an indictable offense. Let's have it pointed out. I didn't out want to put the thing. harness on, but <laughs> but then, like having said all that, we agreed to it. Right. You know, I mean, we did nothing we didn't agree to. Um, but at the same time, you have to own it. Yeah, right. It was really hard to for me to watch the way she was being hypersexualized. Nancy Wilson's version of <laughs> the bunny, the the rock and the roll Playboy bunny. bunny era. Well, now, were you tempted to do this? I mean, uh, were you asked? And if so, were you tempted to put the corset on, put the harness on, <laughs> do the whole what did you call it, uh, hypersexualized act? Yeah, I did my share of it, but they, but the video directors had a different vision of me. They they put me in a welding thing, like a really super tight corset. Wagnerian. Wagnerian, thing. the big Wagnerian queen thing, you know, because <laughs> I was a singer and I was the I was the 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 strong big Wagnerian lady, I guess, in their eyes. So that was that was my <laughs> version of it, which I really didn't appreciate either, but agreed to. So we we both had some some pretty uncomfortable suits on there. <laughs> My feet still hurt just thinking about <laughs> the 80s. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the stories behind some of your most popular songs. What's the story on Barracuda? <laughs> well, Barracuda was just um, a moment. It, it was a flash of anger, of realization of what we had got, gotten ourselves into. It happened one night after a show. Some sl really sleazy guy came up to me and, and implied to me that um, he was really turned on by the fact that me and Nance were lesbian incestual lovers. And that just, that just really got him going. In yeah. his fantasy. That was In his yeah. fantasy, right. yeah. Was, so that, that made me so mad because I love my sister. And my, suddenly my, my mother's face, you know, <laughs> came right up saying like, don't get into show business, it's so tacky. It's so, you know, full of sleazy people that are going to misunderstand you. And I went, oh, you're so right. And it, <laughs> it made me really angry. I think 
especially because I felt that they had attacked her honor and both our honors. Both, yeah. So I went and wrote the words to Barracuda and just, I think I, if I would have had a gun, I might have <laughs> reacted differently to the guy, but thank goodness I didn't. <laughs> It's my understanding when Sarah Palin was the vice president nominee yes. on the Republican ticket, she, she at least some of the time used Barracuda as a campaign song. Yeah. What did you make of that? Well, we, we understood from watching the news and finding out all this necessary information about Sarah Palin <laughs> that she used to use Barracuda as her basketball handle when she was playing basketball. And she was pretty good Sarah high Barracuda. school point guard. As yeah. So she carried that on into her campaign, and, and uh, we were on the tour bus watching the, we had the TV on, watching the campaigns, you know, during the day. We heard that, and we just went, wait a minute, what? Uh, here we go again, you know. We could have written Barracuda again, you know, yeah, at that moment. She, she represented so many things that we were against. Mm -hmm. We just didn't want Palin on our song. You know, so, so <laughs> well, it was so honorific we, in a way, though. They didn't even ask, you know, and we probably would have said no and uh, whatever. It was just sort of. But we spoke up because it should be. A, a, being honorable, you know. It should be the artist's respectful. decision whether they want to be representative of our future country's potential leadership, leaders mm -hmm. or not. Well, did you get an answer back when you protested? They used it again. <laughs> the, the biggest answer back was is that the press went nuts about it. Right. It was a thing that we weren't the only artists that a lot of had artists, that happen. Yeah. At least it brought a finer point to the whole issue where a lot of artists were concerned too and everyone got to speak out. So hopefully people will think maybe twice next time, you know, before just sort of using your intellectual property that way. Well, maybe we'll maybe see. We'll We're see. in the process right we'll now of finding out. Yeah. Let's talk about the song, All I Want to Do is Make Love to You. <laughs> That's a song that um, All I Want to Do is a song that was written by a really famous uh, producer, writer, songwriter, Mutt Lang, who went on to do country music. And you can, you can hear in that song the formulaic thing that was going to become country music that he was up to already at the time. Um, for us, it, was, it just has a great hook. It has a great sound. But for Anne... <laughs> Not yeah. her favorite song to sing. Once again, the, it's the, about the, the, the problematic lead singer. Um, <laughs> has to be authentic. Has to believe in the words she's singing. Even though we changed the gender of the song yeah. around, which um, became then so, uh, you know, shocking that they banned it in Ireland <laughs> because it was a song then about a girl a wanton lassie who picks up a, a guy. You know. Hitchhiker. A hitchhiker. A hitchhiker guy. I see what you mean. You changed it around. Late There's at a night. woman who said, all I want to do is to make love yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah. Like, you're a hitchhiker. <laughs> I don't know you, so let's get in the car and exchange fluids and now get out. <laughs> I mean, that's hideous. Well, I was going to ask you why you hate it. <laughs> I guess that's why. <laughs> but, yeah. again, it was enormously successful. They want to hear that song. Even today, we uh, go to New Zealand or Australia, they're like, oh, please, please do that song. They love that it's song. It's an interesting thing about songs like that, though, because unless you're Ann Wilson and you have to stand there and deliver this message that are, that's in the words, you know, which I totally understand you, why you don't want to do, but most people, when they hear something that they love, 
they're not thinking into all the corners of the right. song. That's right. They're just feeling good and listening to it. So I pull up alongside, and I offered him a ride. He accepted with a smile. So we drove for a while. I didn't ask him. You know, we talked about demons before, and I want to return to it because I don't want to be one of those things people say, well, why didn't you ask him about this? But uh, in the Hart memoir, Kicking and Dreaming, you talk about the problems you've had with weight control. Mm -hmm. How has your weight affected the ups and downs of your weight and the fight with the weight? How has it affected you, first of all, as a performer and then as a person? Yeah. Well, as a performer, it's been at least as much of a, st a struggle as it is personally. Um, personally, it's more about boys and health and, you know, being accepted as a kid in high school, you know, which is, which is hard enough without a weight problem. With one, it's even harder. Uh, as a performer, it may wreck your career. It may put your, your career just gone. Um, I've gone up and down with it. Um, and done things g like gone on every, you know, type of plan and sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. But the thing that has seen me through the whole thing is just remembering who I am and, and, and about the singing, the singing of the songs and the, being a storyteller. And, uh, you know, I think that a, that a heavy person can tell a story just as well as a as a person of, of the correct weight, you know. A few years ago, you hoped to create a tribute to Led Zeppelin yes. at the mm -hmm. Kennedy Center Honors. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, in, by covering their rock epic, what else do you call it? <laughs> Stairway to Heaven. I've seen the video. You brought down the house. The video went super viral on a worldwide basis. Take, I want you to take me back to that night. What was it like? <laughs> Did you expect the reaction you got? Tell me about it. Well, it was a sublime night. It was just one of those life-changing things. We had played a heart show the night before down in Florida, so we leased a private jet. The, the day before, there was a rehearsal in Washington, D.C. for the Kennedy Center Honors. So we f did that, flew down to Florida, did our show, flew back to Washington, <laughs> got up early, went to the Kennedy Center and did the rehearsal for the show that night, and then went to the White House for a reception. Came back and got ready to do the performance. And it was all so machine-like and so much security and very dreamlike because he, here you are, it's Christmas time, it's Washington, D.C., it's yeah. beautiful, you know. And we're meeting the president and Mrs. Obama and then going back and we're, we're up to the moment where we're st standing backstage just about to walk on to do the ultimate I just got rock anthem. I just got nervous <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> again. And we looked at each other, I remember 
just before we walked on, and we we both kind of went, gah, jeez. And then we had two skull rings yeah. that we bumped together like kind of a, like, you know, a talisman yeah. for, for power, bringing power in. And we took a really deep breath. And we remembered the old meditation yeah. trick of when your mind feels like a pinball machine. You just reach out and gather all the balls and gently bring them all in. <laughs> and that's what we did. And then walked out and did the song. Ladies and gentlemen, from Heart, Anne and Nancy Wilson. And then when it was over, <laughs> fell apart! You know, just like <laughs> all the pinballs went, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but um, it was a quiet, really quiet, timeless moment of actually doing the song. I felt really focused and pulled in, and um, really in it. I think part of the amazing emotion of that night during that song, too, was the fact that Jason Bonham, the son of their previous now deceased drummer, John Bonham, was on the drums, too. And so a lot of people say, oh, you made Led Zeppelin cry. I was like, I don't think it was only about that. I think it was a lot about yeah. their rock family and seeing the fruition and, you know, the beautiful... Uh, echoing forward of the generations of their own rock family. Well, you have been so generous with your time and generous <laughs> yourself. So happy to you do this. And think for a second. Tell me one thing about Nancy <laughs> that nobody knows. Tell me something about her I don't know. She has, she, you know that, that she is a beautiful, soft, intelligent, artistic person. You can tell that by looking at her. Yes. But what you can't tell, maybe, is what she's like when she gets her mind made up about something. <laughs> she has an absolute rod of steel up her back. <laughs> she, she just cannot be deterred. I mean, when she gets her cap locked, it's there's, true. there's no um, more stern adversary. Well, I don't get that. I agree with you. Beautiful, intelligent. It's called stubborn. Soft, even vulnerable. <laughs> but you're describing something else. Mm -hmm. Somebody with a steel determination. Yes. Mm -hmm. And relentless drive. Yeah. Goes way, way back in our ancestry, too. Might have some of that from your father, Marine officer. Mm -hmm. And your mother. Yeah. yeah Waited sure. to Marine officer having to move a family all around the world. Yeah, yeah that's for right. sure. And keep the China from being broken. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Keep the silver polished. Yeah. All right. Now, Nancy, tell me something about Anne. Tell me something I don't know. Well, there's a lot about Anne that nobody will ever really know or understand, I think. Probably except me. Maybe Dean, your husband. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't know you very long yet, either. <laughs> He's finding this stuff out. Yeah. <laughs> but I think what people... <laughs> see when they see Anne, it's almost the opposite of what she said to, about me. She, they see this, you know, <laughs> kind of a big diva, strong, loud um, force of nature. That's the first impression. But when you know Anne, you see that there's um, an incredible vulnerability and a poetic almost a child who needs protection and um, is so easily injured. Mm. I've wanted to protect her all my life, like a mom or like a big sister. So we do really well by each other yeah. in those ways because 
there's, I think, nothing quite as intimate as the way we now know each other, mm -hmm. having come through all of our years of experience and, you know, all of the, the successes and the failures, all of it. So, you know, and we still stand, you know, really strong with each other. Thank you. I talk to <laughs> the rest You're of welcome. you. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much. And that's the big interview for tonight. We're always eager to hear what you have to say, so please follow us on Facebook and Twitter or send your comments to viewer at access.tv.